Thank you for coming out uh, this evening to this very important and inspirational event. Um, it's going to be quite unforgettable. I wanted to start off by just introducing myself, giving you a sense of what to expect um, with the program this evening, and then segueing into the heart of the matter. Well, as you know, the, the title for this event is a dialogue on white supremacy, and it features a conversation um, spotlighting Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and hearing the life story of also uh, Ramona Africa. I'm your host, I'm Robin Spencer. I'm a faculty member in the Department of History at Lehman College in the Bronx. I'm also affiliated with the Graduate Center here in the History Department. And our other co-sponsor, the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, which if you're a member of the community at the Grad Center here, or even a community member, you might be aware of them before their fantastic programming and the way in which they really take the mantra of revolutionary education seriously. Well, this dialogue on white supremacy is incredibly important and imperative now. Right? This is the time, as we think about resisting the question of education and learning and community all come into play. This evening represents all of those focal points. Right? So our goal is to listen to a dialogue. It's to understand the way in which we can think through some of the narrative that we are oftentimes presented so uncritically, like around uh, the Second Amendment, around violence in America, who perpetrates, who perpetrates it, who's the victim of it, um, and how it can be transformed. And we can start to think about those steps that we can take along the path to transformation. This event also represents a bird's eye view into political organization, right? So in addition to being a faculty member at Lehman College and here at the Graduate Center, I'm also part of the campaign to bring Mumia home. And that campaign was started in 2002. And the goal of the campaign was to bring a younger generation into the movement for alternatives to mass incarceration, to free political prisoners and prisoners of war. Our particular focal point is uh, the freedom of political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal. I'm sure you've heard of him. <laughs> right, so Mumia Abu-Jamal was falsely arrested in 1981. He spent over 10,000 days in solitary confinement. And he's been fighting in the courts for his freedom for now 37 years. As part of the campaign to bring Mumia home, we organize, we strategize, we meet, we hold conference calls, we plan events, we try to raise awareness about his case, about the larger system of mass incarceration around political prisoner, around the legacies of the movements of the 1960s. And we also build community with each other. It all sounds very mundane. But it's what is necessary to do in order to have some transformation in this country. So part of what you'll see this evening as well is an organization at work, right? Everything that you see here is not just me as an individual, but I'm a representative of a group of people. So I just want to acknowledge um, members of the campaign to bring Mumia home. If you're in the audience, just stand up and so we can recognize you. So what we're saying tonight is enough is enough, right? The system of mass incarceration rooted in chattel slavery, right, must be uprooted. Our understandings of white, what white supremacy is and how it operates must be outed for analysis, critical analysis. We must have those conversations both comfortable and uncomfortable, right? And we must listen with an open heart and mind to the people who found themselves on the front lines of state violence like a Ramona Africa, someone who was an essential part of the political organization MOVE 
and was not just victimized um, as the only adult survivor of the MOVE bombing, but she was <coughs> repressed, right? She wasn't just a victim, she was someone who was actively acting on her belief system. And as part of that, the state retaliated against her and the MOVE family for challenging everything from capitalism to the way the environmental, the way in which people's interactions with the environment um, were aligned with a larger capitalist vision. It's a very holistic vision of activism. I'm excited that we'll be able to gain some insight into the MOVE organization this evening. Events like this are like oxygen for the larger movement of change at a time where it feels that we can't breathe, literally, collectively, right? How can we organize? How can we mobilize, right? Um, it's about challenging fake news and about opening our minds and hearts. Now, we want to take time to also thank our sponsors, the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, in particular, the scholar activists that are at the forefront of that organization, people like Peter Hitchcock, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Mary Taylor, David Harvey. Right? The Center for Place, Culture, and Politics reminds us to be undisciplined in the best sense of the word. Right? It reminds us to think outside the box, to engage with ideology, to learn our history, and to escape from the very narrow silos that oftentimes it feels comfortable to be in politically. Right, so have to give the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics their, their props. Also want to announce that we'll be selling um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, upstairs after this event in room 6107. There'll also be free wine some crackers and cheese and all kinds of noshes. It'll be a place to have a more sustained conversation. So we look forward to you going up after the event to partake in that. We'll also be selling Mumia Abu-Jamal's latest book, Have Black Lives Ever Mattered? As well as clips, as well as the DVD of Inside the Activist Studio. So I wanna talk a little bit about Inside the Activist Studio and give you that introduction to Ramona Africa and really share with you the impact of politics on a life. Right? That is what we get from Ramona Africa. Ramona Africa has been a MOVE member since 1979. She was in her home in 1985 when the Philadelphia Police Department dropped a military grade bomb on her and her family. Eleven men, women, and children perished, including the many animals that also lived in the home. 65 homes were completely destroyed. Ramona was the only adult survivor and was arrested after that uh, with a young boy. She was charged with riot. She served seven years in prison. Following her release, she's traveled the country and even the world, we can say, um, telling her story and promoting the MOVE organization. She's been at the forefront along with uh, Pam Africa and all of the activists um, in Philly and really from Philly to the world, people are struggling for the freedom of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Ramona Africa has been key, a key part of that. Now, I said that I would talk to you about the impact of politics on a life. And so I have the unfortunate you know, duty of telling you that Ramona Africa was not able to be with us this evening. Yes. Unfortunately, her partner in life, her companion, took ill, and she could not come to be with us today. What she also shared with us is that she was not able even to go to the hospital to be by his side because she feared that her presence there might result in some kind of discriminatory action against her partner because of what she symbolizes herself. So just think about what that means, right? In those moments of crisis when we're all just human beings and we're concerned about the people that we love, to not even be able to go and be at the side. That is the legacy and history of repression. That is the definition of the inhumanity of white supremacy. And that is what she's dealing with. And I think it would only be something so serious to take her away from us this evening. 
So we send her our love and our thoughts. This event is being live streamed, so she'll be able to see it. And instead, what we're going to do is bring her into the conversation through other means. Now, the other means is a program that the Campaign to Bring Lumia Home has begun called Inside the Activist Studio. Inside the Activist Studio is an act of radical oral history. It's an act of reclaiming the stories of struggle and sacrifice from the people who lived through the movements of the 60s and 70s for them to tell us their story. How did they become who they were? Who we see in front of us today. Ramona Africa is a long distance runner. And how does she begin? We learn from interviewing Ramona Africa that she started out as a Catholic schoolgirl with middle class dreams, hopes, aspirations, and a perm. Right. We can relate to this, right? Maybe some of us started right there. But she went from that beginning into revolutionary consciousness and change. And the Inside the Activist Studio episode about Ramona Africa gives us a sense of her transformation and her evolution. So we're happy to share some clips about that, um, uh, some clips from the Inside the Activist Studio episode with you this evening. It's also important to note that Inside the Activist Studio is revolutionary journalism. Right, it's built off inside the Actors Studio, which some of you may have seen, hosted by James Lipton. And the idea of inside the Actors Studio is, of course, these one-on-one -on -one interviews. Right, so you'll see me in the clip interviewing Ramona Africa. But again, I'm just one of many. So I want to bring up some of the people who were involved in inside the Activist Studio. This is work that we did on our spare time, such that we had it. This is work that we did when we could have been with our families, could have been resting, could have been sleeping, but instead we put our spare time into trying to create something that could be shared for posterity. Our histories are in peril. We must remember them. They are being erased in front of our eyes. Right? We know that from the news that we hear around us every day. So inside the activist studio is an act of radical recovery. It's an act of challenging fake news. It's an act of revolutionary journalism in the spirit of people like Mumia Abu-Jamal, but also Ida B. Wells and other people in history. So I want to bring up uh, three members from the campaign, uh, Tag, Sophia, and Rebecca, to talk to us a little bit about their experiences as part of the campaign and the process of doing and collecting those interviews, we worked on this for over a year. We visited with Ramona several times. This is how we got to know the beautiful spirit of her partner. All right, so I want to bring up um, Tag, Sophia, and uh, Rebecca, just for a moment. tonight. Um, it's so lovely to see the room filling up more and more. We wanted to say a little bit about what this process was like for us, so we're each just going to say something brief. I want to say that uh, the system, as MOVE aptly calls it, can seem like this invincible monolith that we can't do anything about. And Ramona and MOVE show us a possibility for a better way. Yeah. Hello everyone, um, my name is Sophia, and one thing that I, over time, found significant around this project and this process is the wonderful stories that are shared, and within them, those blueprints that are shared around the work that these activists do, and the kind of uh, experience they have, they have had. So for me, and I'm sure for many of us, it's really empowering to have these kinds of stories that go within such deep uh, corners of their lives to empower us as we continue the struggle in our movements. Peace, uh, tag, peace everyone. And um, thoughts out to Sister Ramona Africa's partner right now. Um, 
most memorable to me throughout this process is visiting the MOVE women uh, inside prison. And um, it was just another reminder of how necessary it is that, you know, within this work that we do, that we make sure to, you know, personally meet up with the heads who are still uh, under this, you know, plantation system that we're up against, you know, and really see um, them within that condition. And particularly in that instance, it was an example of how heads of spirit can really uh, go above and beyond um, a state of confinement. And the MOVE women represent that uh, beyond anything that I, I would have been able to imagine before seeing it for myself. So I'm going to show you some clips from inside the activist studio featuring Ramona Africa and it'll be another way of getting to know her. You will learn more about Ramona Africa outside of the move bombing because that's also what oppression does to us. It makes us seem like our lives are confined to those moments. Right, so we're going to learn about the breadth and length of Ramona Africa's life. I should say that this will eventually um, be uh, publicly available. We will have DVDs of Inside the Activist Studio for sale upstairs at the Free Wine Reception in room 6107 um, afterwards. Also the book signing as well. Please be sure to sign up to learn more about the campaign to bring Mumia, uh, bring Mumia home. And we're also going to have uh, a reading group around Loaded so that we can sit together, read it, and have conversation about the ideas that uh, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz uh, is putting together and has shared with us uh, through her scholarship. So we're going to start off with the beginning of Inside the Actors Studio, which is Mumia introducing Ramona.
three-week-old baby in her arms when most people had come home from jail on a weekend night, Friday or Saturday night. And they came out to welcome our family home. And cops from three different districts, you only live in one police district. Cops from three different districts came out there talking about they got the call of a disturbance of the peace. And um, when we told them there was no disturbance of the peace, we were just welcoming our family home, uh, that there were fraternity houses all around MOVE headquarters, and they never, ever went to those fraternity houses telling them frat brothers that, you know, they had to take their speakers out the windows, blasting all over the place. They had to stop throwing beer cans out their windows or anything like that. They never did that. But they're going to come up to move, welcoming our family home, talking about we're disturbing the peace. And when move came back at them like that, they went crazy. And they start beating move people and knock my sister Janine Africa to the ground, knock the baby out of her arms, and tramples him to death. You know, tramples him to death. And nobody ever got charged for that or went to jail. They tried to use the excuse that move women had babies naturally at home, so there were no, like, system verification, a birth certificate or whatever. But Moves neighbors, you know, around that area came forward and said, you know, that baby did exist. They saw Janine, you know, throughout her pregnancy and saw the baby. And saw the baby, you know. So they couldn't really get away with that, but they didn't do anything about it. And it was like, I couldn't do anything else but adhere to and acknowledge what I was seeing, what I was hearing. This system, its representatives, particularly a judge named Lynn Abraham, who later became DA, is really responsible for me being in movement. She kicked me right on into movement because I had gotten arrested at a new trial for nothing, really. And uh, I went before her for, you know, the trial. And she convicted me, knowing I was innocent. And when I went back for sentencing, she asked me if I had anything to say before sentencing. And I had heard enough <coughs> truth from who by that point that I said, yes, I do have something to say. And I started talking about what I was seeing in these courtrooms and who the real criminals are. I started talking about that. She told me to shut up. I said, well, didn't you just ask me if I had anything to say? <laughs> And isn't this America where you tell the world that in America it's freedom of speech, freedom of protest, and freedom of religion, all these freedoms? She said, no. And I'm holding you in contempt. 60 days in the county jail. So she sent me for two months, 60 days, to the county jail up close and personal with move women. When I walked out of here after that 60 days, it was all over. It was all over. So I thank her. I thank her for her contempt citation. They kicked me right over into move. We almost lost Philadelphia. Tell us about the days leading up to this event. Tell us about life on Osage Avenue, the street where you lived, on the days leading up to May, May 13th. Well, we lived on Osage for several years. The cops knew what we did as well as we did. I mean, they were surveilling us for years. Uh, so they, they knew what we did. They knew us. They knew our kids. Now, the thing is, 
They came out there, whether we say the Board of Peace Commission, came out to our home with warrants for four of us, me and three of my sisters and brothers. The warrants came out of a nothing incident that happened two weeks before May 13th. Uh, our dogs were barking in our backyard. They were barking, you know, really bad. And so we looked out there to see what they were barking at. It was cops all around the back of our house. We turned our loudspeaker on, and for about 10 minutes, no more than 15, we told our neighbors that there were cops all around the back of our house. We didn't know what they were up to, but we knew they were up to no good. We weren't going to let them sneak in on us and, you know, our neighbors, the people in the neighborhood, not know what was going on. We were letting them know what was going on. And that was pretty much what we wanted them to do. Ten minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Turned off the loudspeaker. A few minutes after that, one of the surveillance cops that, you know, was regularly out there, Walked up our steps, knocked on the door. Me and my sister Teresa Africa, who was killed in the morning. We come out, we talk to this cop, you know, uh, maybe an hour or so. He stood there talking to us. The warrants that Gregory Sanborn got came to our house with in May of 85. Charged us with terroristic threats and disorderly conduct for that day, what happened that day. What cop is going to stand up there on our steps talking to us for about an hour if we're threatening him, terroristically threatening him? You know, they went to Lynn Abraham, same judge, Lynn Abraham, went to her home on Saturday. May 11th, to get her to sign those warrants for them to come out there. Mm -hmm. Now, my question was, why did you go to her? Why did you go to her? Well, she was the emergency judge. Yeah, well, what was the emergency? Mm -hmm. The warrants you got were for a situation that happened two weeks earlier, you know? So you can see it was all set up. They had rehearsed, uh, practiced how they were going to attack us for close to a year, if not more. Practiced blowing up a, a replica of our roof. That came out later, but they had done all that. They made this big to do about planning the attack on us. Planning to come out and kill us because they never planned to arrest anybody. They didn't have to do all that. They had plenty of opportunity to arrest us. That's not what they wanted. That was not their plan. And people really need to understand that because May 13th is the day that they dropped the bomb. But they came out there setting up their weapon or planning to kill every living being in that house on Sunday, Mother's Day, May 12th of 1985. That's when it started. But anyway, they, uh, the, the government uses the media to try to happened because neighbors complained about me. Now, all I want to know is when has this government ever cared? When did they start caring about black folks complaining about their neighbors? <laughs> when did that happen? You know, all we have to do is talk to those same Osage residents or the few that refused to move and live you know, on Osage Avenue now. 31 years later, they're no longer complaining about moving. 
They're complaining about the city and what the government is putting them through, and that's put them through for the last thing. Well, you want to think about uh, going inside of the bombing. Um, the police department dropped a C4 military grade bomb on you. The bomb unleashed a ball of fire that was accounted for at 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Additionally, more than 500 cops fired more than 10,000 rounds of ammunition in less than 90 minutes into the house. Yet you were inside. Can you take us inside? I'm going to pause there. I want to say that asking that question was very difficult for me. Um, I felt like very shaky asking that question because to sit there next to so close to someone who, who had undergone such terroristic violence was like almost too much to bear, right? So she goes on and she tells her story um, and inside the activist studio, um, which is available upstairs afterwards in the free wine and reception, uh, she tells her story of the humanity of an inhumanity of those those moments. So I'm going to pause there because I think it gives you a sense of what we're trying to do with Inside the Activist Studio. The first person that we interviewed was Sekou Odinga and I got a chance to ask him why did the movement free Asada Shakur? What was that like? To the extent that he could give me any information about that. So giving you a sense of the types of questions, the type of history that we're trying to put out in the general public around inside the activist studio and the power and the potential of the project. We're going to move on in the program um, to our panel discussion with Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and Johanna Fernandez. So I'm going to introduce them. I want to remind you, you have this flyer, right? So thinking about coming out to support the campaign to bring Mumia home and Mumia Abu-Jamal on January 17th, ask one of us for more information, call the number, email, um, so you can get on board uh, with providing that kind of support or otherwise learn about the campaign to bring Mumia home. Violence. Right. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz has given us this book, Loaded, a Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Right. So Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz grew up in rural Oklahoma, the daughter of a tenant farmer and a part Indian mother. She's been active in many movements, the international indigenous movement for more than four decades. She's known for her commitment to the national and international social justice uh, issues. Uh, some of, she's written many books, very powerful works. One of them, The Great Sioux Nation, was the fundamental document at the first international conference on indigenous peoples of the Americas held at the United Nations headquarters in Geneva. Uh, she's also known for another powerful book called An Indigenous People's History of the United States. I can recommend that book to everyone. It's incredibly powerful. She's here to talk to us tonight about her book Loaded, which is literally fresh off the presses. It was just released to the public in early January. And this is her book launch in New York, right, to give us a sense of how to think about the question around violence, gun culture, etc. She's going to be um, in conversation with Professor Johanna Fernandez. She teaches at Baruch College. She's been playing an active role in the freedom of Mumia Abu-Jamal um, for decades. She's a well-known and well-respected activist scholar here. She's working on an incredible book on the Young Lords Organization. Well, her book is going to be uh, coming out soon, and you'll be able to find out more information um, about that. But her book is on the Young Lords and really how that history of activist struggle um, and what bridges we can build between um, Puerto Rican and other communities and uh, communities of African descent, by the way, which are not too mutually exclusive categories. Right. So I want to introduce Johanna Fernandez and uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, and they're going to be coming up and be in conversation. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, we're doing quite a bit tonight, um, and part of what we wanted to do, given that Ramona Africa is not here with us, is to really give you a sense of what it meant to interview Ramona. Uh, by the way, uh, the next series of Inside the Activist Studio is called um, the John Brown Files, because we are, we are going to be interviewing white revolutionaries like Susan Rosenberg and Laura Whitehorn, both political prisoners. It takes a village to create um, inside the activist studio, so we encourage you to join us uh, in this project of recovering the history of radical resistance in this country. Um, I just want briefly to talk about the process for me of working on Inside the Activist Studio and the Ramona Africa interview. So we interviewed Ramona. It was like a two and a half hour interview. And given that we live in a period where you guys don't like to pay attention for more than three seconds, we had to shorten it. And so we edited the video collectively. Um, the 10 or 11 of us who were part of the campaign to bring Mumia home who, who worked on this project. So we watched the interview a million and one times. And every time we were riveted and what I realized was that when you walk through the fire, when you experience repression, the way the MOVE organization experienced repression, Ramona Africa literally walked through the fire when her house was bombed, you either gain clarity that's unimaginable or you melt into the background. And Ramona Africa gained incredible, knee-jerk, common sense clarity that all of us um, need. One of the things she said that grabbed me and that is part of our trailer is that we talk about love all the time. But if you really know something about love, you know that love begins with yourself. And self-defense is the premise upon which self-love is built. And black people and indigenous people and oppressed people around the world have to defend their lives and themselves, but they're criminalized <laughs> for it. So I just wanted to share that, um, and, and we don't have time, but other, others who worked on this video could share part of the process and what was incredible about this interview. At the time that we were watching the video and editing it collectively a million times, I was asked by Greg Ruggiero, who's here, to blurb this book loaded on the Second Amendment. And I'm reading this book, and there, the themes in the book go hand in hand with the material that um, we are getting from Ramona. Ramona is talking about resistance to violence. And Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz is giving us a sense of the origins of um, state violence and terrorism and white supremacy. So we thought we need to put these two people in conversation, especially given that it's all happening at the time that white supremacists are marching in the South with tiki torches. So that's why we decided to bring um, these two women together. I want to thank Greg Ruggiero, Ruggiero who's um, an editor at City Lights, the um, house that published Loaded, for asking me to read this book. I was reading it, and I was riveted. Um, and uh, I was so riveted that I was like, I know that this book is not supposed to be out, but I need to let the campaign read it. Um, so we, I distributed it, we didn't send it online, um, and we had a reading group in the campaign about it, and that is part of 
um, what brought us here. And we bought 50 books, which are up um, stairs in room 6107 6, on sale. We want you to get this groundbreaking book. Um, so without further ado, I think the author really needs to talk about this phenomenal work that's going to change the historiography of American history and of the American Revolution. Um, I want you to tell us, which I wanted you to tell us more in the book, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Who are you with these amazing books? Um, and tell us a little bit about um, the road you traveled that put you on a path to study white supremacy um, and colonial violence in the United States. So how, how do you get to, to Loaded? Um, what's the personal narrative that, that brought you here? Thank you, Joanna. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's, it's a real honor to um, uh, be a part of this, um, uh, sponsored by this wonderful group. And Joanna and I have actually done a panel together before a couple of years ago at the Left Forum, so I feel like we're back in our groove here. Um, and uh, I'm very uh, honored that um, that the book uh, is useful to to the work of uh, of the committee, and um, and it's fine that you read it, but but it, it you should read it again because it has improved since the <laughs> the first draft that was sent out. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, I start the book um, with a story about myself. Um, I'm a 60s uh, Wait, veteran. Wait one second. I think we have, we're having problems. Well, maybe it's your phone. Oh, is it? <coughs> okay. Go ahead. She's confiscating, I'm confiscating my phone. I'm confiscating your phone. <laughs> you know how we get attached to our phones. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm a 60s veteran, uh, and um, I, I'm an uh, unlikely 60s veteran, a uh, 60s person, I think, because of the background I came from. I never, until I started meeting um, uh, African Americans from the South in the um, civil rights movement, met another person in, in the movement who came from tenant farming family and in Oklahoma. So that was, uh, it's a very different experience. Um, and I did have um, some teachings uh, in socialism because uh, my grandfather was uh, wobbly and he was uh, in the Socialist Party in Oklahoma and he, w he was uh, a kind, you know, a farmer uh, with nine children. So even, you know, that profile of who's a who's a wobbly is also kind of um, uh, stereotyped as, um, uh, and my father told me stories uh, about his name. Uh, his name is Moyer Haywood Pettibone Scarberry Dunbar. And those are the founders of the IWW, the Wobblies. Um, so that, um, I had that, but. <laughs> I had that. I also, in Oklahoma, it was once Indian Territory. Uh, the settlers who came in there, like my, um, my father's family, my father was born there, but the year they came, 1907, um, they, uh, the land of the native people had been allotted. Uh, the ethnic cleansing east of the Mississippi, forcing all of the people out. You've heard of the Trail of Tears. Uh, but there were multiple trails of tears, 50 different um, Native nations rounded up and forced into to live in Indian Territory under Andrew Jackson's presidency. So this is um, uh, a very mixed situation. We also had um, um, freedmen from, um, 
from the Civil War, actually soldiers, combat veterans, who um, were given allotments by uh, the federal government in Oklahoma. So the, the tenant farmers in Oklahoma were white, black, and Indian. And um, sometimes they came together for rebellions of war. So there's some interesting things I tell about in the other book, Indigenous People's History of the United States. And I also did a memoir about my childhood, uh, Red Dirt Growing Up Oki, that tells the, the story of Oklahoma. But uh, fortunately for me, I think, uh, coming from this background with very little knowledge about the world uh, outside of Canadian County, Oklahoma, um, or even a part of Canadian County, Oklahoma, um, and before any kind of telecommunications and when the press was very uh, censored in Oklahoma by the oil industry um, and the only uh, radio station and newspaper was owned by, um, it was really an oligarchy that took over from, you know, that defeated the socialists and the Wobblies and, and took over and it was, it was an industrialized place. Um, and um, I, uh, is the civil rights movement. Uh, when I moved to Oklahoma City uh, for my last year of high school, in the first integrated high school in Oklahoma, Central High School in Oklahoma City, um, there was a wonderful young uh, African-American leader of the, of the sit-ins, which uh, preceded the ones in, the, uh, they were the first ones in Oklahoma in 1956, 57. Uh, sit-ins in the big drugstore there, and her name was uh, Claire Looper. And um, I'd see pictures of her in the paper, and I said, that's who I want to be. That's what I want to be. Whatever, whatever she's doing, that was my role model, this activist who wasn't much older than me. I think she was about 19, and I was 16. Um, so I did get uh, actually get involved in, uh, there were uh, race riots uh, in that school against the black students that were brought over from the black school. Um, and um, it's the first time I had to take sides in something, um, sort of this, whose side are you on? Because it was either you were with the racists who were ugly and beating up on uh, dis destroying the lockers and um, uh, stalking uh, the women students and they were so, you know, very well um, prepared by the movement to to deal with this. But um, they were real role models. So this was um, a, this was a very poor school, by the way, all working class students. It was the downtown school and everyone worked. Uh, it was a trade school, basically. And I worked full time while I went my senior year of school. So that was really, it was then an aspiration. Where do I, where do I sign up for this? You know, how do I get involved? And I'm always, I always remember this because it's not that easy. Movements uh, can be very insular and not welcome, you know, someone who looks different. Like uh, this was the time of Jackie Kennedy soon. And that's how I wanted to look, you know, with a little shift dress and a bouffant hairdo. And um, so I, uh, I, I was a unicorn, you know, almost. Uh, but it, so it, it was kind of tough, but I was really determined. And then I, I moved to San Francisco in uh, 1960 and uh, went to San Francisco State University, which... Um, became better known as an activist place in 68, but it already was. Um, the Hallinan brothers and Willie Brown um, uh, had just graduated there. And so they're doing redlining, I got involved in that. So this is how, but by how the book starts is by 1970, a lot had changed uh, in the movement. Um, we didn't know exactly uh, what COINTELPRO was, but when we found out later, it uh, made a lot of things a lot clearer that was happening, so we got pretty paranoid. And so we armed ourselves. I was uh, based in New Orleans, organizing out of New Orleans, and um, 
Um, my, our partners, um, our group, were the Republic of New Africa, Virginia Collins and Walter Collins, um, really amazing people. So, so we, um, uh, after the Black Panthers and the Ninth Ward were uh, held up and, and uh, almost like the move situation, um, uh, really trying to, to wipe them out, uh, we, we started getting threats from the Ku Klux Klan. David Duke was new on the block uh, as, the, as the Klansman and calling us, and, and he was based in New Orleans threatening us, threatening to bomb, so we started getting guns. So I, I call the first chapter Gun Love um, uh, because we kind of, these guns kind of distorted our politics because um, New Orleans is very humid. We had to clean these guns all the time, oil them, polish them. And I think, you know, they started becoming like pets. Uh, we, got, we got very attached to them. And I came to realize later that that's part of the gun nuttery in the United States, the, you know, the permission to have guns, it's sort of like, um, you know, cocaine or something. It's empowering, but it's uh, not always um, has a purpose, you know. It can uh, sort of distort your purpose of whether you need them or not. Uh, so that went on for about two years. So I tell about how that proceeded and, you know, going to the gun shows and and the kind of people there with the Confederate flags and swastikas and, and all. Um, and um, then um, I, um, uh, I was pretty much a, a uh, um, total activist. Um, when Wounded Knee happened, I was very, in uh, 1973, for you who are younger, you may not know about it, but it was, a, it was sort of like Standing Rock, um, and very much like Standing Rock. A lot of the same people, actually, the elders were all um, AIM people, American Indian Movement people. And um, I got involved in support. I didn't go there, but I got involved in San Francisco Indian Center with support. And this sort of uh, changed my trajectory where I was going because I um, had decided to, I had been in graduate school and I left, you know, just to be a full-time activist and organizer. I decided to um, go back and I was at the stage of doing the dissertation, to do my dissertation. And I was doing it on the Southwest, the history of land tenure in New Mexico and uh, with Spanish colonialism. And, I, was start, I had started studying colonialism. What got me interested in that, of course, were the Third World Liberation Movements in Africa and Asia, and of course the Vietnam War, National Liberation. And um, uh, then our movements, the American Indian Movement, the Puerto Rican Movement, um, the, the Black Power Movement, also had very much that Third World um, Liberation context uh, and um, I think that's sorely missing now. Uh, my friend Vijay Prashad is, is one of these people sort of trying to revive that, that kind of energy of what colonialism is because it still exists, neocolonialism, but real colonialism in the United States. So that's um, um, the other thing Joanna uh, wanted me to talk about is that it's the, this isn't a memoir loaded, but I have two instances where I talk about myself. And that that's the, fir the first one's the guns. But wait uh, a minute, because we gotta get into it. Okay, you want me to Before wait for Mumia the other calls. one. Okay. Oh, is Mumia calling? Uh, I, that was supposed to be a surprise, sorry. Um, maybe, I don't know, he's in prison, so he might be able to call. Okay, we got to move this along because uh, I've realized that this, is, this was supposed to be the premiere of the Ramona Africa interview. But part of what is happening organically is another interview with another titan. Um, history that we don't know. We don't know that the first civil rights sit-ins didn't happen in Greensboro, North Carolina, but rather in the Midwest. Um, and so this is exactly the history that we're trying to 
um, explore. Um, part of what you argue in the book or you pose is that we tend to think of the right to bear arms as something bequeathed to Americans, white Americans, by the Constitution and the American Revolution. But this idea of bearing arms was intrinsic to the colonial project in, the, in what became the 13 colonies. That bearing arms was part of the culture in um, the early republic or in the early colonies because it was required for survival if you were a white colonist. Um, so you tell a riveting story of state building in the US in this early period forged out of a savage campaign of forced relocation and ethnic cleansing. What's amazing about this historian is that she talks about ethnic cleansing. I haven't read an, a, a history book, and I'm a historian. I was trained in one of the best schools. No one ever talked about ethnic <laughs> cleansing when we talked about the early republic. So you, you talk about that, about the process of the Second Amendment uh, coming into being much earlier than we imagine, the culture of violence in the early period, um, and the fact that citizenship in that early period was tied to gun ownership and it had a racialized character. So can you flesh that out for us, giving us some details that you discuss in the book? Yeah, the um, colonies, they first, um, uh, Virginia was the first colony, and of course the famous John Smith, who was a, a, a mercenary, he had uh, been mainly fighting uh, Muslims in Turkey uh, for the British, a, a irregular warfare that they were doing in, in the Muslim world. And he accompanied the first settlers to Virginia, Jamestown, 1607. Uh, he had uh, mapped out before that, the whole uh, Atlantic coast area up to New England. So it was all, all of what the 13 colonies became, was called Virginia at first, Northern Virginia and Southern Virginia. Uh, so it started at, um, actually at what's today Virginia and went up to Massachusetts Bay Colony. It was that, that periphery and, and of course didn't, go farther than the Appalachian Mountains. So it was really a, um, a coastal, Atlantic coast, a uh, little uh, sliver of colonies of the British. Um, so they um, began uh, uh, forming um, uh, voluntary militias in the colonies in both Massachusetts Bay and Virginia uh, to um, appropriate native land. Uh, these people all, along the coast, the indigenous peoples, they were all um, farmers, subsistent farmers, corn, beans, squash, blueberries, strawberries, all the th products, all the uh, uh, items that they had invented themselves that um, they cultivated for already for 10, 20,000 years in that area. And, and they were also fishermen fishing beds. So they're not the kind of Neolithic hunter out in the, they had very um, tidy and uh, plotted out villages, uh, deer parks, uh, rather than tromping around in the mud, hunting a deer, they, they created a foliage uh, that would attract the deer to graze. So it was a form of animal husbandry more than, um, than um, um, you know, domesticate, there wasn't domestication, they were absolutely free until they were taken for uh, food. So, and other animals too came in into these deer parks. So this is 
um, the civilization that was appropriated. So you have the idea, it's a, uh, the narrative that usually presented is that these um, poor starving uh, Christians that were running from uh, oppression uh, came and is a wilderness, you know, this thickness of woods and, and they hammered out um, a new civilization out of nothing and there were just some savages running around. And it's actually just the opposite of that. There's no way they could have um, built these colonies uh, on their own. They didn't. They had didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the know-how. They they came from cities mostly. They didn't know how to farm. They appropriated. They took what was already there, and pushed the native people out. And because they already had a warlike. You know, they've been doing these crusades for six centuries against Muslims. Um, and although these were Christians, there was a whole contingent of military people always with every, um, every project of colonization um, who um, they were uh, not regular military but irregular. But then the citizens started forming their own. And in the colonies, they started requiring that every uh, settler have ammunition and weapons um, available to be called on to go and um, uh, raid Indian villages, take them. And of course the native people didn't just take it, they fought back. So they would attack the white settlements. Uh, so this victimization that you see in uh, a white culture today comes from that sense of being surrounded because truly they were. They were a tiny minority in a civilization that they had no right to be there taking, um, looting. So they were always afraid. Um, I say, you know, it's 65% um, of the uh, people who own these 300 million guns in the United States are white men. You have to ask yourself, what are they so afraid of? You know, that they have to have eight, an uh, average of eight per person. Because there's 300 million people, 300 million guns, but most people don't have guns at all. Or if they do, they have one. And uh, for a purpose, a particular purpose. Um, Self-defense or um, um, in some cases uh, a, hunting, a hunting rifle. Um, out in the West to shoot rattlesnakes or whatever. Um, but they're not gun collectors. Uh, so these people are, and a good part of that 65% of gun owners are white, are white nationalists ideologically. So this isn't a small thing. We'll, I know we'll get into that. Um, so back to the, the building up of these militias, then of course, enslaved Africans were a part of the cargo of Columbus in 1492, um, and they also enslaved Indians. For the first hundred years of uh, Spanish colonization, Indians were equally enslaved, so there's a lot of um, um, hybridity, uh, especially in the Caribbean, of um, native people and, and Africans. Uh, who were enslaved in many, many rebellions, slave rebellions. Uh, similar things happened in Virginia and Massachusetts Bay. Um, but it was in, um, it was when the Barbados planters, white planters, um, started migrating with their slaves. These were very wealthy um, slave owners, sugar production in Barbados. Um, they started colonizing a part of Virginia uh, that is now called South Carolina. It came to be called South, the South Carolina. Uh, and they, um, from the beginning, African uh, Africans outnumbered, enslaved Africans outnumbered the white people just as they had in Barbados. And still today, you know, it's... Uh, almost, it's still the most heavily, uh, the largest percentage of African Americans. Um, so they, they brought with them slave patrols. They already had slave patrols. These um, 
uh, citizens that everyone, every white person, white man, was responsible to, um, if there was uh, an escapee, a fugitive, uh, enslaved African, uh, they were responsible to, um, to um, uh, follow, you know, to find that person. They used horses, they used dogs. Uh, this, this escalated, of course, in the Cotton Kingdom under the United States uh, to a, a very routinized and almost like an incarceration system. Um, so they, uh, they brought these slave patrols, and this, then it's, they spread from there. And this was in the, the late uh, 1600s, about 80 years after the Massachusetts Bay Colony got. Um, and they took, they, uh, well, in, in South Carolina, they formed the, it had already been ethnically cleansed of, of Native people, almost. They were, they're still pushing some people out. But they, um, they um, brought intact their slave patrols with them that practice. But in Virginia, where they already had the Indian militia, the militias to ethnically cleanse, to take the land of um, the Indians, they pulled out uh, slave patrols out of the militias. And um, then the other colonies all started uh, developing uh, slave patrols, and this is the and Mumia's um, his little his especially the pamphlet book. I don't know if you have that here, but the ones um, Greg uh, City Lights did before the Black Lives did Black Lives Matter. Um, he um, this that that book of his that came out I think three years ago really made me realize I had to do a whole chapter on slave patrols because it was very important because I had mainly dealt with militias. But he pointed out, and it's absolutely true, you know, I, I, you can really document it, that the, the contemporary police forces in the United States are direct descendants of slave patrols. So this, why this constant, constant killings by police of black men, this is, uh, this is it. You know, it makes no sense unless you um, trace that genealogy. So I do that in, in that chapter. Um, then, of course, when the United States became, where the Second Amendment came in, it's, a, it's actually more pernicious than you would imagine. Um, that's why I think some people who who think 80% of U.S. Americans, and that's, you know, that's a big percentage, um, in polls say that they believe the Second Amendment is a constitutional right uh, to bear arms, even though they want gun control. But if they knew what, they, what it was based upon, that it was a mandate for these militias to continue, the Indian militias, and slave patrols, and um, for each white settler to have the right, almost the obligation, to um, voluntarily police. There were, co under the British, you know, in the colonies, they had constables who, any problems with white people among themselves. So they had that kind of um, police. It's, as they did in Britain. But this was something else that formed out, outside of that and was homegrown in the United States, is unique to the United States. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are really unique to the United States and confuse even us, certainly confuses the rest of the world. Why do people have so many guns? Why, what are they so afraid of? You know, they've never been invaded by Anyone? That Pancho Villa uh, <laughs> in Columbus. <laughs> he held off Columbus, New Mexico, for about three days <laughs> um, during the Mexican Revolution. So um, this uh, is not really a secret. It's not like there are secret documents or hidden archives where. This stuff is really in all the history books you read. 
um, the information is there, the citations, but it's not put into a narrative that makes any sense. You know? um, so it's uh, all, what I feel I do as a historian is almost just rearrange, you know, just put into a narrative what all this means, what it signifies. So the Second Amendment is the reason 65% of white men, there are also a lot of white women, 80% of the gun owners of these 300 million guns are white. So that means there are quite a few women, uh, white women who also own guns. Uh, but these, um, this is clearly a, a, an issue that is, has a history, and that history is never explored. The Second Amendment um, came from, you know, when e each of the colonies declared their independence in the Declaration of Independence, each colony declared their independence as an independent sovereign state the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, they were each separate. That was the Confederacy. And what the Constitution did was create a federal system where they were all hooked together with a federal uh, central government, but then all these um, states' rights, uh, as we know, uh, were very powerful. So eight of the colonies already had in their constitutions after 1776 of uh, the right to bear arms and the right to um, uh, the right to form militias and they don't have to say what it's for the right to bear arms and to uh, form militias to kill indians and uh, control enslaved africans they didn't put that in there but that's that what else are they for <laughs> you know well, one of the startling um, revelations of your book uh, is that it was illegal, I think, in Virginia to leave your home without a gun. Right. It was illegal in Virginia to go to church, I think that's what yeah, you say, sure. to go to church without a gun, and it was illegal to not have your, you know, your armament ready to go, oiled up. And if you didn't have all of the um, ammunition, you were actually fined by the state. Yep. So can you talk about that? And can you begin to tell us then, what is the relationship between white supremacy, violence, and white citizenship? Yeah, this um, this requirement, it's, um, it's an early formation before independence in that it continues. It, I call it a sort of dance between the settlers and the federal government because the settlers are empowered to kind of do the dirty work, you know, do the, the counterinsurgency and raping and burning villages and killing um, civilians, native people, um, getting um, rewards for tracking down enslaved Africans. These are actually called slave catchers. That's different from the slave patrols, but that became a lucrative business in itself. Um, even uh, scalp, uh, there was a commerce in Indian scalps that the different um, uh, colonies uh, paid to anyone who brought the scalps in for to show they had killed an Indian. They actually got a reward for that, and it became a business. So these were all built into um, uh, what became the United States, and they hadn't changed. They had split, and I, I think you have to see the American Revolution. Um, Gerald Horn, of course, this wonderful book, The Counter, Revolution of 1776. Um, and I really recommend reading it because it says it was um, it was to prolong um, to continue slavery because slavery had been outlawed in by Britain, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, and um, uh, and there's another part of that that Gerald doesn't deal with it. I do in Indigenous Peoples History 
it was also to um, uh, go over the La Appalachian mountain chain and, and claim that territory over there as well. And the British had a line, a proclamation line, that um, no one was to cross over the other way. It would stay Indian country forever. It would just be, this would be the colonies. Uh, so those are the two main reasons for the revolution, which makes it a very reactionary revolution, you know, completely different interpretation. And Gerald Horn's book is really the best thing on that. Wait a minute. Can you repeat that? So the American Revolution happened because the colonists wanted to explore Washington among them, who was a big speculator, land speculator. They wanted to explore um, and colonize lands beyond the Allegheny River, beyond the Mississippi River, essentially. And the British had other fish to fry. They had cut deals with the Native Americans and told them, yeah, we're not going to bother you in the Western territories, but the colonists wanted that land. And so you say in uh, one of your uh, chapters that the Stamp Act, remember the Stamp Act we learned in, in, in high school, no taxation without representation? The Stamp Act, um, what, did the, what did it pay for? For the cost of the military to contain and suppress the colonies from expanding further into Indian territory. Yep. So the American Revolution was not about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, or it was at the expense of Native Americans and enslaved people. The British, ironically, were like, we are fighting the French, and we want to colonize India, and we don't have time to deal with you little people in America. We can't deal with this conflict, because we are leading, you know, we're an empire. And the little colonies were like, well, we need to take those lands. Yep. Yeah, they wanted their own empire. They called it, uh, Thomas Jefferson called it, the empire for liberty is what the vision of the United States was. So, um, yeah, watching, uh, you know, I've said, um, uh, if you think about it that, um, and know about George Washington's career as the biggest land speculator in the colonies, um, when I was a kid, they taught us not only did he cut down the cherry tree, but but he uh, yeah, and he didn't uh, he admitted to it. He didn't tell a lie, but he also he he also um, was a surveyor, and this puzzled me as his little rural you know girl, uh, because I had a cousin who who was a surveyor, and it was a very proletarian job, tromping around you know with these little instruments and not very well paid, and um, his wife was already always wanting him to get a better job. And a surveyor, I said, this man is so wealthy, I'd seen pictures of his house, you know, the, uh, what's his house called, I can't remember. Washington, D.C. is where his plantation was. And um, uh, I didn't find out, I, you know, this is one of the things I pursued to try to figure out why George Washington had this, uh, this other hobby or why was he doing it, you know, why would you do that as a hobby, uh, go tromping around surveying. And it, it, it said in the Ohio country, but this was while it was illegal to go there. Uh, while it was still a colony, he was going there, and of course he was leading his militia. He was the head of the Virginia militia, and they were doing the dirty work. He was leading them in there, and he was then making um, uh, sales papers and selling that land back in Virginia. To he didn't own it; it was unceded land. It was people were on it. Shawnee Indians, Miami Indians were farming there. And Ohio. In, yeah, in, in Ohio, across, the, um, uh, across the, the mountain chain. And so I call him, uh, you know, land speculator, the biggest land speculator in the colonies. 
But what does that mean? He's a real estate man. So I'm thinking, now we have come full circle. We have Trump as a real estate man. And speculator, this is, uh, this is an important um, uh, marker, you know, for us who are trying to organize for social justice. We've gone through a cycle now. It's time for a definite change. But anyway, that's, that's um, uh, I actually said that C-SPAN was recording me down at Politics and Prose in Washington. And I forgot they were there. And I, I probably wouldn't have said that because, you know, it would... Maybe they'll edit it out, let's see. <laughs> so. Can I quote from your book? Sure. When I read this, I was like, oh my God, this is it. The militaristic capitalist powerhouse that the United States became by 1840 derived from real estate, which included enslaved Africans as well as appropriated land. The United States was founded as a capitalist state and an empire on land and slaves as capital. This was exceptional in the world and has remained exceptional. The capitalist firearms industry was among the first successful modern corporations. Gun proliferation and gun violence today are among the results. Can you? Tell us more. Yeah, uh, I also mentioned that the, the arms industry is, uh, the U.S. is the biggest exporter of um, small arms, firearms, uh, but also, you know, bombs and stuff. And these are the only things left that are almost, that are made in the USA. Um, so I guess when um, Trump means jobs, more jobs, more jobs, it means more guns likely, because that's the only thing made here. So, um, yeah, the, the, um, the, the um, I got off my train of thought, what would you ask me? So, <laughs> I, I thought that you, you mentioned that there's something special about U.S. Oh, capitalism. The exceptionalism. Yes, you know, there are actually, um, it's not my original idea. I have for a long time um, theorized that I, I think capitalism, uh, I mean, I've studied Marxism, I've studied capital, and that's certainly not where this idea comes from. But um, when you look at the United States, it's this except, exceptional, and the, and the form of capitalism in the world now that the United States has... Um, has uh, propagated um, what what were th what were the um, means of communicate uh, of uh, accumulation um, the main item of uh, accumulation and taxation uh, in the new republic were land land sales uh, and um, real estate is still ideologically still the basis of U.S. capitalism. If you remember 2008, it was the real estate market that collapsed. And I think the uh, fear and, you know, terror and the, the, uh, the, you know, is one industry, you know, why are they so upset? But there, it's the ideological center. But what you have to remember is that a part of this real estate, that is this ownership of property, are African bodies. And there are these new books, uh, Edward Baptiste. Um, my favorite one is actually uh, Walter Johnson's River of Dark Dreams on the Cotton Kingdom. And they've theorized, these historians have theorized um, in the last few years. And it's, it's coming to be, I, I think, more accepted that um, the US capitalism and, and in industrialization began much earlier than it usually dated, that the United States was the richest uh, economy in the world by 1840. You know, they try to portray the United States as this little scrawny little thing, you know, just barely surviving all the time, and these colonies very barely surviving. This is the most powerful economy in the world by 1840, totally based in the Cotton Kingdom. And that was, you know, the ethnic cleansing of all of the, the 
the Choctaws, Chickasaws, Cherokees, uh, Muscogee uh, Creek people. Uh, this was their rich farmland, the Mississippi River Valley, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, all, all the way up to St. Louis and Illinois. This is the, um, this is the richest um, farmland in the world, and it's all plantation agriculture. Industrialized is agribusiness. Now, it was already plantations were agribusiness, but it became... Uh, most of these plantations were absentee owners. Uh, it became more like um, the model of Barbados in um, the Caribbean of um, the Africans outnumbering. But the other part which is um, really hideous uh, to talk about um, is that uh, the old colonies, Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, they had ruined the land by monocrop production, not, rate, you know, not uh, leaving fields fallow like the native people had done. You know, they said, well, these fields are fallow, we take them. But the native people let, let the land rest and didn't overdo it, so they didn't destroy their habitat and their food supply. But these were not food supplies. These were all commercial products. They were tobacco, indigo, cotton. Uh, non-food products, they raised, of course, rice, but it wasn't for local consumption. It was, it was to um, sell in the Caribbean to feed the enslaved Africans. Mark San, we, we have to move uh, along quickly. I don't know what happened here with my uh, timekeeper, but I have a, a question or two that I'd like you to answer. Because we need to get into contemporary politics. Yes. Um, Recently, the FBI um, identified black identity extremists, essentially um, a denigration um, of the Black Lives Matter movement. And part of what the FBI is doing is drawing a direct connection and a parallel um, comparison between people fighting for their lives and what they're calling white nationalists or white supremacists. What is the problem with that comparison? Well, you know, white, white nationalism, if you think about it, it's a redundant term. It's really US nationalism is white nationalism. The, all the narratives, all the stories, all of the um, historians' constructions, they may uh, give a little bit and be more inclusive, but it's all within that same framework and narrative of the original settlement, uh, settler state. Even the, the immigration, it, it seems so contradictory that, uh, that uh, of course, it's really about Mexicans and most more recently added to that is, is um, uh, Muslims. Um, but the nation of immigrants, this, you know, this construct, it's a settler, it's a settler state. Uh, it's like Israel, a settler state. And the Palestinians are very similar. So I find young uh, activists these days know more about Palestine than they do about the United States, their own country. Um, <laughs> that uh, uh, so I have to give the example. Will you understand the situation of Indians? It's like it's like uh, Palestinians. It's like Israel, a settler state. But uh, of course, uh, Israel was set up, set itself up as a little United States, as a, as actually consciously using uh, the the patterns, the frameworks, the idea of the reservation system. So was the apartheid system. Both of them in 1948. Um, and they borrowed from, these are what uh, some historians call the covenant states that believe they, they come from God, you know, they're founded by God. Um, and I have a whole chapter on the cult of the covenant in, in, in there too, but yeah. That, I got some questions in here the before we got to wrap it up. You I, want me to talk about important. white nationalism? Oh, okay. yes, go ahead. Okay, yes. <laughs> so this white nationalism that you're seeing now that's called white nationalism, uh, we sort of other these people like they're, you know, these crazy people that do um, um, like the tiki uh, torches and all. 
but it's, it's actually a much larger population. These are sort of the, the um, mm. stormtroopers, you might say, uh, to make an analogy with another place, um, for um, a very large population in the United States that is really now, you know, the basis of uh, politics. I mean, it's the primary basis, power basis of politics. Um, and that's, that's a complete counter-revolution from the 60s. And I go through, you know, the, the whole rise of mass killings and the proliferation of guns. It was a reawakening of the Second Amendment. The NRA was taken over by, literally by neo-Nazis, by actual fascists in 1975. It's very much a, a John Birch Society in the 1950s and the Minutemen. This is the counter-revolution against our revolution in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. And we sometimes are very confused about what happened. Why did everything start going backwards? Um, but again, it's that dance of the settler and the uh, government. So the government on the one hand is creating affirmative action or, you know, uh, Medicare or these things that seem good, but this, this other organizing is going on that now has, has become apparent. Uh, you, you can see it now, but it, it was forming all that time. You can kind of mark the Goldwater loss as the, you know, marker of the beginning of that counter-revolution. So it's, uh, it's state violence, but it's also settler violence. And, and why can't we make a correlation between the stance of the Black Panther Party for self-defense and the violence perpetrated by white supremacists? Because this is, the violence of the oppressor cannot be compared with the violence of the oppressed. Can you help us flesh that out? Well, yeah, and this, uh, this new FBI description, they're trying to create a, a binary of these white nationalists that you saw in Char Charlottesville and the um, Black Lives Matter, and they have nothing in common whatsoever. Um, they call it an identitarian movement. Um, and this, uh, this, of course, goes back to that kind of criminalizing of the black power movement. And where I lived in Louisiana, the Republic of New Africa, um, is, is uh, um, and that, that's why sometimes we're, we're missing this national liberation understanding that we had back in the 60s and 70s. Um, <laughs> Of, uh, uh, of the right to revolt, the right to um, be a people and to, um, to flourish and not be colonized and oppressed, decolonization. Uh, and that's being revived, but we have to also look back and see, and I know most of you here do, how much we have to learn from um, from the 60s, from the black power movement then, both mistakes but also uh, what we've inherited in terms of courage and, and clarity. But it's gotten a little clouded, so I think it's even more important than ever. And Mumi is sort of a symbol of this too, a li you know, a living symbol, still speaking, um, that um, it, ha it just has to be multiplied, that, that rhetoric, if you want to call it that, that knowledge. Can you take us home with um, a definition of white supremacy? Um, because the term is in vogue. It's been accepted in yeah. American society and it's spoken. But the notion of white supremacy that exists out there is not the definition and understanding that we have in this room. So what's the definition of white supremacy that you want this audience to take away and um, we tend to think of racism as a black problem, but racism is really a white problem. And so what do you tell, what's the responsibility of white people in this struggle? Yeah, well that's really important. And of course there are a lot of uh, uh, really great um, anti-racist white people um, all across the country. Uh, I think knowing more of the history, um, 
and problems of um, of the past to say the abolitionists and the a lot of the racism that was carried um, along by abolitionists um, uh, I think personally that only John Brown was the only single person there that actually saw African Americans as totally equal who lived with you know in his up, upstate New York uh, it was it was a way station uh, you know for the Underground Railroad and families were always living there they ate together they but that wasn't true of and I think that we, there's an analogy with today that white supremacy is so we know it infects everyone you know those tests they did that led to the the Brown versus Board of Education desegregation the the tests of uh, of little black children who saw white pictures more beautiful than you know pictures of people who look like themselves um, uh, black faces so it infects everyone everyone because white supremacy is really the ruling culture of that runs through every institution through education and it manifests itself in um, uh, it's more subtly now, you know, actually it's getting more, of course, less subtle these days, which is kind of refreshing because, you know, it always was uh, the dog whistles and the welfare mothers and, the, you know, these, these euphemism. Now it's just, you know, outright uh, hatred. Um, but white nationalism, uh, white supremacy is an old uh, Christian, you know, it's tied to... Uh, uh, Christianity fighting against Muslims, Africans, you know, basically fighting against um, um, Arabs and Africans. Uh, most of Africa was was already um, Muslim, uh, uh, and and especially in Spain, you know, the ethnic cleansing of the Muslims and Jews. Uh, this was called limpieza de sangre, testing their cleanliness of blood. So white supremacy is sort of this core of colonialism and capitalism. It's inseparable from what, what came, uh, that all non-white people are subservient to, to this white European race. And... Um, now others can join in, you know, a few can be accepted into this circle and they can also be act in that superior way and, you know, put down people, but it's, um, uh, that's necessary because of the civil rights movement. But it also shows how it's, it's a general, um, it's generalized, it's everywhere, it's everywhere you look. So people who think they're anti-racist and anti-white supremacists who are white, um, it, it, it's not just in, in gestures, you know, it's actually, I think, um, taking the responsibility to know this history and know the lineage, the genealogy. I've really studied my father's family, the uh, white settler family, Scots-Irish, um, these kind of, you know, trekking so, uh, the Andrew Jackson people. And um, it's, uh, you know, it makes me understand better what, how I think, you know, and, and how I can um, think differently. And we really can, but it has to go pretty deep. And it, it's not just behavior, you know, how you behave around someone else. It's actually having knowledge uh, and gaining knowledge. And how you think how you think. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to open it up for questions. Thank you so much. That was incredibly powerful. I want to leave us with your words on the right to revolt. And I want to acknowledge someone who embodies that right to revolt, who's in this room, and that's Pam Africa, who's right there. <laughs> So I want to have her stand up and have a round of applause.
And after the Q&A, I'm going to invite her up to give us our marching orders. <laughs> so feel free, there are two microphones on either side. We have enough time uh, for a few questions. I know that this was a very provocative talk. You heard about the Bible and the gun, right? You heard about slave patrol and slave catchers. You heard about something called the empire of liberty. Right. So lots to talk about. So we would love to hear your comments for um, Dr. Dunbar-Ortiz. How you doing? Raza Khan, Nation Tom, Judicial Research. Where are the books? The books are upstairs, and they will be ready for you to purchase them right after the program. Oh, okay. That's yes. <laughs> You've got a lot of interest in the book. That's wonderful. <laughs> Other questions or um, comments or feedback uh, for Dr. Dummer? Yes. Hey, how you doing? My name is uh, Bob. And um, I was actually uh, raised in uh, the swamps of New Jersey and then shipped off to college in Philadelphia in 1979 and spent 79 to 85 in Philadelphia and um, unfortunately witnessed a lot of this stuff and what Ramona said up there about the frat house, that very well could have been me. Um, you know, and, and what I want to say is if, I don't know if anybody witnessed it, we only knew, and I was an ignorant little 18 year old kid, and I only knew what my parents taught me, the crap that I heard in the 70s from, and I don't, I don't, I don't, say, I don't even want to say my color, your color, that color, I, I tell people I am color blind. And, 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 and we, only know what we, we, we only know what our parents taught us. I'm sorry? You know, so, so I go off to Philadelphia, and I got this, like, kind of somewhat bigoted, handed down view. And then the news in Philadelphia, you know, and I'm sitting here listening to the, the, uh, the lady talk about the American history, and I'm thinking to myself, as a little kid, what, 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 uh, point of view did I have of the American Indians? They were bad people, cowboys and Indians. We played cowboys and Indians as, as kids. And then I go off to Philadelphia and I'm just some, some ignorant kid in the city and I'm only told what the people in Philadelphia told me, which was on Channel 6 News, and if I can me mention the documentary, Let the Fire Burn, and then M Mumaya's got a, got, somebody did one on his documentary, and it's, um, my life, be, uh, I believe it's my life behind bars, and they're both very good, they're very accurate, and Philadelphia was corrupt. I could go through my phone, I could spend an hour educating you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we have someone at the mic waiting, so yeah, I, I'm, yes, I, I'm sorry, we appreciate but it. Yeah. It's just, I really came here just to say, you know, and Pam's here, and I, and I walked down Osage, and I said hi to these people, and they said hi to me, you know. And I just came here to say, you know, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Okay, we have the question over here. Uh, is this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Roxanne, for that amazing, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz, for that amazing uh, talk. And um, it's really inspiring to hear this. And I wonder if. Ramona Africa was here tonight or could have joined us tonight. What would be uh, a question or thought you had you would have for her? That's a really good question. I I'm so disappointed. Um, I mean, I love having you know Johanna, but um, I, and I'm glad we were able to see the, um, the film. And I, I want to get I want to get it. Um, but. In our conversation, I imagined um, with um, Ramona, I, I think I, I wanted to ask her that question that was so difficult that you kind of cut off. I still want to hear that answer of what was it like to be in there at that time. And there's a poem in... Um, um, that I quote in the um, loaded book by Sherman Alexi. Um, and that's how I imagine, if you, if you read that poem, that I was going to show that to her and I, I said, is this what it was like um, to be inside that house, inside that inferno, with bullets coming in? 
um, because to me she's just a a survivor that is so special because of the knowledge she has from that experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to say that I am so happy that I'm here. And I thank you for sharing the, your knowledge, giving your knowledge to us. Now, there's one thing that, uh, and I'm going to start with the question that was uh, posed to, okay. I think that question can be answered by many of us here because I believe that even though I may not have been in that house, okay, I may not have been in the belly of the ship when they brought some of us here. I may not have been on the shores or wherever in the Americas when the invaders came. But that is transmitted through time mm. within us. Yeah. That is why we can see and feel, and that is why many of us are here today. Because there's this, this, this spirit that says, you must go. You must stand. You must be counted. You must rebel. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that I wanted to say to the question uh, that was not answered, but Ramona, I, I, in viewing the, uh, the, the film, you are, uh, you have the full lineage. Yes, that'll be a wonderful thing. We'll be able to uh, see and understand. My question is, with all the history that you have shared, the history that we may possess, the situation in this country at present time with Donald Trump, what do you foresee as being the future? Because I feel that the Americas, they're at the last stand. There uh -huh. is, at this time, they will have to either stand and be victorious or be wiped out. And many of us, you know, you, uh, the thing about capitalism that, uh, 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 was it George Washington going forth and and, um, you know, doing the survey and all of that. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. All right. The money, 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 money. All right. In Palestine, all over. Right now, we have the influx of people in a country that's ancient. And I'm speaking of Africa. Claiming, saying, oh, yes. Uh, let me help you. In Puerto Rico, you have people coming in. They didn't give the help to the people, okay, who are in the colony, who need help. But they're there now to say, I want to purchase this land. Don't worry. I want to purchase that land. Capitalism and the removal of the people from the land that they don't have to fight because it's a colony. You can call it whatever they call it, a protect, whatever, a commonwealth. It's a colony. And you take, the, the colon takes what? It gives out what? So, can you just give me your thought on that? Okay, are we at a moment where they, you don't give up your gun. You collect them. Tell me, what do you feel? Thank you. Well, 
Well, this is certainly a time of um, reckoning. I agree that um, this is a um, catastrophe that is so serious, given the uh, also the global warming, having capitalism having destroyed uh, the planet that we live on, um, that we, um, I think of that, you know, how I keep going, I keep thinking of that, um, what the Cuban revolutionaries um, say, um, and which I heard very young, and I said, that's, that's what I'm gonna hang on to, is you never give up, never sell out. Um, No se vende, no se rende. So I think, though that is a, um, a static stance in a way, you know, I, we have done pretty well surviving. Um, but now we, we've got to overcome, for sure. Uh, and I think we, uh, we have to figure that out. Um, I feel like in the last year that people have been getting together in groups. I've traveled across the country a lot and um, are discussing in all kinds of ways um, oh, what are we to do. So how I think people who are here, you have to take on the um, responsibility of leadership. And leadership, I mean um, modeling for people and being very clear, uh, speaking very clearly and not holding back. Um, I decided to do that in the last few years is I'm not, um, there's so much um, uh, blurriness in what people say, well, I'm, there's this and then there's this to really be clear about things. And that means getting it straight, getting it down. So I think these these study groups, these people coming together, um, that we have to figure out what this country is, who is the, you know, who is the enemy, uh, what is the, um, uh, what is the plan? Do we have a plan? Can we figure it out? I think we feel overwhelmed. I remember when Jesse, when I was working um, in the um, uh, Rainbow Coalition back in 84, um, that uh, at that time, the voluntary military was a majority black. It was really a poverty draft that had been started uh, only 12 years, 13 years before that. And he used to say, um, you know, when he was asked if uh, he was afraid of being assassinated, if he, uh, and he said, they don't dare, you know, by the, he said, maybe some nut, but they, the system, if he got elected, they wouldn't dare because I have the army. Um, because he had been doing educational work with these young soldiers. Um, young people on his push organization. And I, I didn't realize that he was very, very in touch with um, young people in the military. I, I know that, you know, that condition doesn't exist now, but there's still, it's still an army of the um, a draft of the poor. And I think we need to, um, the white nationalists are organizing every day, nonstop, uh, within the military in the Marines, and the Air Force, the Navy, the Army. We have to, and in our lives, if we have young people going into the military, try to persuade them not to, I think, or to go in with a purpose um, of educating. So I think that that's really um, essential because we have the biggest military in the world domination, it's a very militaristic society, um, and getting more so in endless wars. So I think that's one thing I, I think of right away, and that means really a working class project, because these are all working class, it means a multi-racial, multicultural project. Um, so, uh, I mean, I would like to have the army on our side, 
is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, our final question. And remember that we'll be going upstairs. There'll be lots of informal time. Dr. Dunbar Ortiz will also sign your book. All those good things will be happening shortly. We're just having our final question down. Saludos. Yes. Uh, my name is Carlito. I'm a former member of the Young Lords. Um, I embrace uh, your stance on the right to armed self-defense. Um, I think that the, uh, one of the central problems that we have today is that that, has, that theme has become like a boogeyman in our heads, okay? Uh, if the right has the right to arm themselves, we have the right to also carry better weapons than they do. My, I do not have a question, but I do want to uh, highlight what I consider to be your sublime point in your, in your presentation tonight. And that has to do with the obligation, the moral obligation and onus of the white populace in this country. Uh, because that is a theme that tends to be belittled uh, even by the predominantly white left in the United States that's plagued with chauvinism in itself. And until we start addressing that question, then how the hell are we going to deal with white nationalism? Because white nationalists, we have this view of white nationalists as being the KKK and the Nazis. But every white person in the United States is cursed with white nationalism. And that's where we have to begin to start. Um, that is not to dismiss that there are white progressives and white revolutionaries, but white nationalism is like an unofficial religion in the United States. And, and, and that is something that we have to grapple with and address straight into the eye. You know, so I like to salute you for raising John Brown because my man was on point. You cannot be apologetic or be uh, uh, ready to dialogue with someone who you have to uh, punch the life out of. So uh, on that, Sister Roseanne, thank you. Powerful. Finally, I want to direct your attention to the double-sided handout that you should have received by now. Um, on the one hand, it tells you about the wine reception, the book signing, and sales upstairs in room 6107 after the event. On the other hand, it tells you Mumia needs you. And we're going to bring up Pam Africa to talk to us about what are some actions that we can take in this moment to help free Mumia Abu-Jamal, to challenge the, the, the mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, and to move towards a more just society. So Pam Africa. Wow, <laughs> we want to bring you to Philadelphia. We must, exactly yes, we, the we way it is. Load it. Oh wow, you gave me some ammunition to go back with. I'm saying, this educational piece here tonight, and uh, are we loaded tonight? Yes. I just, I am so glad I made it here tonight, <laughs> you know. Mia, um, you know, I hate to speculate why he didn't call. Um, he, he's a little, he's sick today. Right. I was up visiting Mumia yesterday. And um, when I came home, when I left the prison, I was speechless. Um, Johanna and I went up last week um, to visit him. And all, uh, you know, um, just to make sure we knew he's sick. 
and he's getting sicker every day. When Mumia walked off a of death row, and we did that event at the um, Constitutional Center, we knew then that Mumia's life was more danger then than when it was on death row. These people don't like to lose. And uh, so while we're doing one thing, they was far advanced of us, and uh, because people were so happy to get him off a of death row, missed the point. We were supposed to bring him home that day. And we wasn't supposed to pause at all. Because we did pause and was hap happy with a fake victory, and you know, because the only victory we could have is bring him home and other political prisoners home. I want to make this fast because I know we um, got time, and, uh, but I want to tell you why I was upset. And our uh, mummy has been getting sicker and sicker for the longest. And when Mumia first got real sick the last time, we didn't know what we were looking at. We saw certain things that was happening to him. We saw his skin change, we saw his feet swell, we saw, you know, different things happening, and um, we got a diagnosis on it, so we fought for hepatitis C, which they said we would never get, and uh, because it was $1,000 a pill, and you had to take it for 90 days, we won that. Not only did we win it for Mumia, but we won that for other prisoners throughout the United States. But Mumia is in the hands of the enemy. So that hepatitis C, um, they gave him the hepatitis C cure. They say that he's cured of it. But what we're seeing is the exact same thing that started him being sick the last time is quickly coming. And our Mumia feet is so swollen he can't get them into the shoes, into his sneakers. And uh, when he walked in there, he's always trying to put on a big thing, you know, for people. When he walked in, I was messed up because I knew what I saw. And, uh, you know, um, then sitting, you know, sitting there talking with him, he began coughing, right? And when he coughed, he would grab his side. And, uh, you know, and you can see the pain in his face. So he said he thinks it's something in his lower lung and also his liver, and because uh, they gave him cirrhosis of the liver. And uh, I'm going to talk more about that, you know, upstairs, if people are coming upstairs. But I'm telling you, I was so messed up. I started talking about it a few times, and then I couldn't talk about it no more last night. And, um, but we got to talk about it. They are slowly, Mumia said they moved him to slow death row. It's slow, torturesome death row. He said he burns on the inside all the time. It was cold in the visiting room. But Mumia was like this, and you know, and I was asking him questions, and he said, but I'm hot on the inside. And all uh, you know, but it was this coldness out there. Um, just looking at Mumia was just horrifying because I can see him quickly, not slowly, because he's much worse than what it was when we saw him last week. And he was worse than when Dr. Joseph Harris and Mark Taylor saw him on Saturday. And uh, they didn't see what I saw. And uh, I could tell because it wasn't written in the notes or the information that went out. He didn't know about the feet had swelled and the ankles had swelled unbelievably within two days, three days. And, uh, you know, the coughing and the holding of the side, that wasn't there. They gave him cirrhosis of the liver. And, uh, you know, and everything that they're doing promotes something worse, you know, in him. We got a chance on July 17th. And we have tickets here for people to get on the bus. Oh. What did I say? January, July? January. And I'm tired of this cold weather. <laughs> you know. So um, January the 17th, there's a court case. And they say, Mumia needs to see you in court. I know I'll be there. The question is, will you? Do you understand that these people are killing Mumia? And not only Mumia, they're killing 
a lot of political prisoners, a lot of people that are not considered political prisoners, you know, within the prison system and all, but I think that everyone inside them prisons are political prisoners and are and they're political prisoners of war. There are some in there and all who are fighters and who was fighting these people from the beginning and wound it up in there. And on this, those who was politicized why they were in there. But each and every last person is a victim of what you've been teaching today. Um, so we're asking people to get on the bus, January 17, 2018, um, at 8 a.m. What is it, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m.? Oh, that's the time of the court, right? So where is the buses leaving from? We're leaving at 5.30 a.m., 147 West 24th Street, second floor. That's where you pick. See, they just handed this to me. And I cannot pretend. Joanna, can you read this? Yes. Um, so this is the story, guys. Mumia's case has been, conviction has been closed for some time. And at this moment, we have the possibility to bring Mumia home. There is a judge in Philadelphia that is bringing the DA's office to court to explain where Mumia's records went and to explain to the court and to the judge and the people who will be there among you what happened to a memo. So what we need to prove in court right now is that the judge who denied Mumia's appeals, Judge um, uh, Ronald Castile, who was previously a prosecutor, um, was biased because he was involved in prosecuting Mumia's case. He should never have um, presided over the case as a judge. So you probably heard that there's this thing that the judge is asking the DA's office to release the files. Well, the DA's office was forced to release the files. We found one memo. One memo, which was an answer to DA Castile's request for information about Mumia's case. So we have the response, but somehow the original request is lost. And it is that request which will help us prove that in fact, Judge Castile, who was previously a prosecutor, was hell bent on um, prosecuting Mumia and ensuring that the state of Pennsylvania killed him. And if we crack this puzzle, all of Mumia's appeal will be opened um, and Mumia is gonna come home. So that's why we need you to be in Philadelphia, January 17th. This is probably one of the most important moments in Mumia's case since the 1990s. Right, and you know, I wanna add to that, when people came to Philadelphia when this first happened, the courtroom was full, the hallway was full, outside was full, and the judge felt the power of the right. people. So what he said to, uh, in court, was that he would turn over all the files to our lawyers so that they can go through them and see them. One week later, when there was nobody there, and uh, he had pressure put on him from his bosses, and he turned around and said that he will look at the files in an in-camera um, um, viewing. And uh, that meant our lawyers couldn't look at it. We can only get what it is that he see, what he said. And also, we do have this one thing. We want all the files. So that's why we got to fill that place up. The hallways, the uh, courtroom itself is a rather small courtroom. And our uh, butt, and uh, you know, we want to fill that. We want to fill the hallway. We want to fill the outside. They have got to see and feel the pressure of the people. So we can't have a little bit of people here. I'm saying we got to arm ourselves any way necessary to get this job done. And also, uh, um, and we, so there are people with this sign on, event organizers. Um, if you want to go to uh, Philadelphia, we'll manage to get you there. Um, there's going to be a sign up sheet. You should come upstairs with us and sign up. And we're also selling these bus tickets. Um, so Mumia really needs you. The movement needs you. A victory for Mumia is a victory for all. 
Um, and part of what, what we're trying to do uh, in the campaign is to build a culture of resistance. It's time to get back into the streets in this country, um, right. to free Mumia, to end mass incarceration, um, to fight toward abolition, to end capitalism, to end wars abroad, to free Palestine. Um, so uh, we ask that you stay, that you talk to Roxanne upstairs, and that you join our, our struggle. We, we, we need to organize to uh, interview the other John Brown. Uh, Susan Rosenberg is online. We've been meaning to interview her for, for a year. Um, so we need people to, to really join um, our work and, uh, and mostly to be in the streets in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you. On the move. Mumia lives because we fight and we don't stop. I'm talking about all of us.